Welcome. There's a lot of excitement in this room. It's really great. We've been looking forward to this talk for some time. And um, big thank you to all the staff here and to Alva and Holly who arranged all this lunch. Kept getting bigger and bigger, more people calling. And yes. And usually we do this luncheon in May, and we had to switch them around because of college um, stuff. So this is in April. Usually this is when we do our little tiny bit of business meeting. And I really just have one pretty small thing, which is I will tell you who the next year's officers and board are going to be. And we'll need to have a yay, and hopefully no nays. So uh, the board who's going to continue again for next year, I'll be president, Beth Benjamin. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Don't need to, please hold your applause, Lydia. <laughs> Marilee Howard, who unfortunately lives in Oregon, but she manages to do a great job as vice president and uh, helps with publicity. Alba Cisneros will be our secretary again. Although, <laughs> If anyone else would like to uh, join the board and be secretary, that would be fabulous. David Shearer is our reporting treasurer. And the other at-large board members, Holly Beckner, Ren Bure, Kathleen Ford Minor, Kathy Garcia, Marty Hartford, Joyce Lamphere, and Sally Monastery. And all in favor of having that board for another year, say aye. aye. Yay. Oh, wait, wait. Any no's? Any abstains? Thank you very much. And we really could use a couple more board members. We've lost several. Um, it's a very pleasant board. We have nice meetings on the first Tuesday of the month at 1030 here at Scripps. It's fun to be at Scripps. Um, please, if you're interested at all, come to a meeting. We have a couple more before the year is out. Um, you don't have to be um, voted for. You could just um, serve with us. The, the net is now out. And if you haven't joined, if you're not a member and you'd like to join Fine Arts Foundation, you can join today and your membership will go till June of 2020. So even though it's only April. So yeah, that's, wait, I think there was one more thing. Oh, I just let you know, one more thing, because it's appropriate to this group. Next month on May 3rd, the unveiling of the, at Mount SAC, the unveiling of four mosaic panels that um, Alba Cisneros has made that are paintings by my dad, Carl Benjamin, is a grand unveiling at 12.30 a.m. on May 3rd in front of the art complex at May 3rd. So there's some scripts tie-ins. So now I'd like to bring up Holly Beckner, who has really made all the arrangements for this presentation, and she'll introduce Allison. Hello, everybody. My name's Holly Beckner. I'm new to the board and new to all of this, and I have to say I'm just so excited it actually happened. I wasn't sure last night it would. You know, you all mysteriously appeared. It's a great thing. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Alice and Alan. Um, you know, quilting is really an effective and evocative storytelling vehicle as well as a traditional woman's craft that often captures not only the unique history of a family, because you're using those families' materials, but also of the time and the period and historically what's going on. And Ms. Allen, it, who is a master African-American quilt artist and historian, who, uh, who focuses on uh, the tradition of African-American quilting history and origins of movements that have followed slave era quilts and the Underground Railroad, she uses her pieces as um, as informational art themselves. So, so some of her work is replicas of the historic pieces, so we get to enjoy them and learn something about the history from her artistic work as a quilter. She's, as I said, she's a quilter, she's an author, a teacher, an instructor, a curator, um, <clears throat> and uh, she, she also received her BS from Oregon College of Education, received her master's and a teaching credential from USC, and is a former high school uh, English and special ed teacher. 
currently based in Sun City. Her work has been exhibited all over California, all over the country, and in different countries as well. Um, <clears throat> San Jose Museum of Quilted Textiles, Temecula Valley Museum, Kellogg Gallery here at Cal Poly, uh, the Ontario Museum of Art. This is all locally. It's been exhibited, her work's been exhibited in Golden, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Jersey, Albuquerque. She has had both pieces in other exhibits and solo exhibits, including one entitled Maya Angelou, a phenomenal woman who exhibited throughout New England. And some of her pieces move with what you folks may be familiar with, who are quilters, the All Mancuso Quilt Show, which displays at different uh, places throughout the country, and she has often showed with them and has had solo exhibits, including the G's Bend uh, revisited. Um, she currently has an ex uh, a special exhibit, uh, and st and still we rise: race, culture, and visual conversations, which is traveling, uh, and it premiered at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. And she also has an exhibit currently with uh, called "Conscience Conscience of the Human Spirit: The Life of Nelson Mandela." It's an international traveling exhibit, which is going to be premiering. Which is pre has it already premiered? Yes. Premiered in in South Africa. She's received grants and awards and residencies from a lot of different, from the LA Department of Cultural Affairs, California Arts Council. More than I can say. Um, I first became aware of Allison's work when I went to the Ontario Art Museum, Art History and Art Museum, where she was doing uh, a program on her own quilts and historic quilts of the Underground Railroad, which was just fascinating. So um, I am just really excited and honored to introduce you to Allison Allen, if you'd please welcome her. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm always uh, trying to remind myself, don't say thank you, ladies. Say thank you, quilters, because there may be several gentlemen in the audience who can appreciate what we're doing today, too. <laughs> I just want to expound on what Holly started with. For almost 30 years, I've been teaching my quilting and handmade doll making through grants, state and local grants. I pretty much am a, the typical starving artist because I apply for grants at least six times a year because the grants allow me to create my work or develop an exhibit or a project and I still own the work. So with that, I'm accumulating an unreasonable amount of quilts because I don't have to, like other quilters may make their quilts to be able to sell them. I make mine to be able to have new pieces for lectures and exhibits. She mentioned Mancuso. A lot of you in the room who are quilters, are there quilters in the room? Yes. So you're familiar with the Houston uh, show, which is considered the largest show in the country. Houston is considered the largest show because it's two weeks long. One week is called Market, where they have all of the vendors from all over the country that do the fabric, the cutting tools, the thread, the scissors, any of that. And then the second week is a quilt show. And so those vendors, before they take down and leave, your work in the quilt show is exposed to those vendors and that's how you get a sponsor. So they may see your special quilt in the show and then contact you and ask you, okay, I represent Aurafil Thread. We'd like you to use our new line of thread in your quilt and that's why it's a big deal to get something in the Houston show. But Mancuso National Show Management is the largest quilt show entity in the country. Mancuso does eight national quilt shows every year for the past 30 something years. I had a piece, Precious Cargo, in Road to Cal in 2010. It, it was at Cal Poly Pomona in 2007 after it was in a three woman show at the Korean Cultural Center on Museum Row in Los Angeles. And when it was in Road to Cal, 
Time Warner Cable sent a reporter there and asked, are there any pieces in Road this year that speak to black history? Because Road to Cal is in January and Black History Month is in February. And Matt and Carolyn Reese, who organized Road to Cal, their uh, mother and son, at that point they had probably done Road to Cal maybe 25 or 30 years, Be well, at least 18 or 20 years, because I think next year is their 25th year. They gave Time Warner Cable my name. So there were probably eight or 900 quilts hanging just that year in that one show. But they weren't talking about quilts of zebras or people in huts or anything. They were talking about something that spoke to black history. So they were talking about this quilt. The person from Time Warner contacted me and the interview that she did showed about 10 or 12 pieces of my work. So when Mancuso saw it, then they contacted me and they asked me if all 10 of those were available to share as a special exhibit. So from 2010, every year, including this year, the pieces that I'm about to send, Mancuso has reserved special exhibit space for me. And it is such a blessing and such an honor. They don't ask me to send them pictures of the quilts up front. They want to know the name of the exhibit next year and how many pieces. And I, when you get to that, hey, I'm still trying to get to that, OK? And it, in 15 and 16, I was part of their faculty. I did teach at uh, Oasis when they had it in Palm Springs. They only had it in Palm Springs, 15 and 16. And I did teach at PIQF in San Jose for them. They are out of Pennsylvania, but PIQF is their biggest show. This past year, my special exhibit for them was comic book icons of color. The reason Mancuso reserves my space is because, as Holly mentioned, the Maya Angelou exhibit, the comic book icons of color. One year I did uh, She Rose, Influential Women in History. That was right after the London Olympics, since we had so many gold medalists from uh, countries that were women. That was the most women that had uh, gotten gold of any Olympics. So each year, my special exhibit is not just, OK, these are flowers, these are butterflies, these are teacups. Mine is always information art. I try to make each piece a teaching moment. And I believe any piece of art can be a teaching moment whichever way you want to use it, whether you're talking about your technique or you're actually talking about the subject matter. This year, once I got comic book icons of color back in the mail, then Houston is doing quilted comics. So they asked me if I would pull one of my pieces from comic book icons. So they want the storm, the quilt that represents the superhero storm from X-Men. So like I said, when your work is out there, then sometimes you don't even have to send it to be juried or judged into a show. You have it out there, and the right people are seeing it. And I do about 15 different lectures, and one of the lectures is get your work out there. And I talk about over a dozen different ways to expose your work locally, nationally, and internationally. And most of those ways do not even involve fees. I had a piece that was traveling for three and a half years with the organization Quilt for Change. And the exhibit was Water is Life, Clean Water and the Impact on Women and Girls. And the piece that I had in that exhibit was called Seven Months Ago. And it premiered at the UN headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Then it went to Rome, Italy, it went to four different embassies in Europe before it traveled in the States. And then it went to Houston as a special exhibit, and it traveled with all of uh, the Mancuso shows. So one show led to another just because you have a piece in one exhibit. And that happened to have been an internationally traveling show that did not have an entry fee. Because once you're entering your work in things where they're getting not just hundreds, but thousands of entries, then the entity knows they don't have to charge you an entry fee because that many people are trying to send work. And that was an international call for entry, and they accepted 41 quilts from around the world.
The Nelson Mandela tribute that she spoke of, once I had exhibited my Quilted Pages exhibit at PIQF in 2012, then the woman who organized the other exhibits after that, Dr. Carolyn Maslumi, she was in touch with someone from Oakland who saw the exhibit at PIQF. And I drove up to PIQF and then drove back. And by the time I drove back, there were all these messages from California Arts Council, Dr. Maslumi is trying to get in touch with you. Carolyn Maslumi was the NEH National Heritage Fellow two years ago. She was recognized by the Smithsonian for organizing the most influential quilt exhibits over a 10-year period of African-American quilts. So she did the And Still We Rise exhibit. That was in October when I came back from PIQF. She was inviting me to put a piece in And Still We Rise. It was an American history timeline. It ended up with 64 quilts. And it started with the first quilt in the exhibit as you enter was a slave ship. And it had quilts from Katrina. It had quilts Trayvon Martin, the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, Emmett Till, it, was, it had a, a, just a com comprehensive timeline in quilting. So the only two spaces she didn't have depicted had to do with Civil War or, or antebellum. So I told her that I had already researched Kathy Williams and I would probably do that quilt. Now this is in October, you know, when PIQF is. She said, well, only downside, I need the piece by Thanksgiving. And all of the quilts had to be 50 by 50. So, <laughs> so I'm used to working under a serious deadline because I am doing the dozen pieces for Mancuso every year. And that's above and beyond any quilt show I want to submit a piece for. And that's besides... OK, can you put something in locally? And that's even after it's so-and-so's anniversary, the end of this year, are you making them a quilt? So, <laughs> so I did two quilts. One was called The Runaway, and it was the back of a woman, and it was showing her back was lashed from being whipped as a slave. And the other piece was Kathy Williams' Buffalo Girl. And when I sent her the two images of just the two tops by Thanksgiving, she picked the Kathy Williams and she said, uh, great, you were able to put that together. I need the actual quilt by New Year's Eve. <laughs> so, <laughs> but needless to say, she got the quilt and it did travel with that exhibit. <laughs> Kathy Williams was the only documented woman in the 19th century who enlisted in the regular U.S. Army disguised as a man. Women served with the U.S. Army as cooks and laundresses, but they were not enlisted in the regular Army as soldiers. Only one cousin and one other individual in her same unit knew that she was a woman. She served for almost three years, and then it was because of the weight of the pack and camping outside, she contracted uh, pneumonia and trench foot. And then at that point, she had to see a doctor, and that's how she was discovered. And when they asked her why did she enlist in the first place, she said because she wanted to be able to collect her own pension. The regiment that she served out of the longest amount of time was stationed in New Mexico, and she was assigned to the Buffalo Soldiers. The Buffalo Soldiers, many of you may know, were the black units at the end of the Civil War period, and they were most active, actually, after the Civil War because the government assigned them to fight the Indian Wars. And the Indians and the African Americans had a relationship that the rest of the country did not fully understand. So there is a lot of mystery behind how the Indian Wars were claimed to have been fought and settled. But the Buffalo Soldiers 
became famous because they were the all black regiments. Now, any descendants of the original Buffalo Soldiers are the U.S. Park Rangers all across the country in Yellowstone and Grand Canyon and whatnot. The park, the first Park Rangers after the Indian Wars were the Buffalo Soldiers all over the country, and their descendants are still the Rangers. Kathy Williams has a mile marker in New Mexico. She's a hero in New Mexico. She never was able to collect her full regular pension, and that's part of our real US history. There were black soldiers who never were able to collect their regular full pension. She was given what was called a compensation, which most of the black soldiers were given, and it was significantly less than what their white counterparts were paid. So people have been fighting for civil rights long before the civil rights movement in this country in the 50s and 60s. The other exhibit that Holly mentioned after I did and Still We Rise, when we went to the premiere of that exhibit at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, then at that time, Dr. Maslumi announced to us that her next exhibit was going to be the tribute to Nelson Mandela because he had just passed away earlier that year. So all of the quilters that had participated in And Still We Rise were hearing her pretty much open call before anyone else. And they had a national or international open call because they invited quilters from around the world to put something in the Nelson Mandela exhibit. They accepted 33 quilts from the US, 33 from the US, 30 from South Africa, and 30 from other countries. So I did two for that also. <laughs> and this is the one that I just got back two months ago. It had traveled with the Nelson Mandela exhibit. It premiered at uh, Africa Quilt International in Johannesburg in 2014. So I just got this back two months ago, so it traveled for three and a half years, something like that. And the Michigan State University is the entity that does the National Quilt Index. The National Quilt Index is the documentation, the international documentation of historic and modern quilts. So all of the exhibits that Michigan State curates, then they automatically are on the National Quilt Index. But if you have a quilt that you know has already been identified as an heirloom, or if you have a piece that you know you've had appraised and it's a valuable quilt that you made yourself. You can apply to the National Quilt Index. They'll send you the paperwork. There's a fee for your quilt to be listed, but at that point, it's permanently archived through um, Michigan State University. So when I was in Cincinnati at the And Still We Rise premiere, I was handing out cards after I went up for show and tell with cargo. And I handed a lady a card and she gave me one back and it said she was from the Atlanta Underground Railroad Quilt Museum. And I said, oh, while I was making this quilt many years ago, a friend of mine had a layover and she went to the Atlanta Quilt Museum and she met with the owners and they sent me a package and a sweet note two weeks after she was there with African fabrics. And they were asking me if I could still incorporate these in the quilt in any way. And while I was talking, she said, and Allison, I addressed that envelope to you. So that's the small world. And we've been having a lot of small world moments because just 10 days ago, I was chosen as the 2019 recipient of the Seven Degrees of Inspiration Grant Award through the Laguna Beach Arts Alliance. And the guest speaker was the actress Marsha Gay Harden. And as she was coming in, I was going into the dinner, and I told her I was glad to meet her before the crowd came, and I'm a fan of her work and whatnot. And she asked me, was I on the 
Arts Council board. And I said, no, I'm one of the award recipients tonight uh, for quilting. And she said, oh, that sounds wonderful. Quilting can be very exciting. And I didn't realize that until many, many years ago when I was at a beautiful museum in Cincinnati. I said, I wonder if it was the Underground Railroad Freedom Center. She said, yes, it was. What a gorgeous museum. And it really is. If you've never been, it is fabulous. I've been to the Getty. I've been to the Louvre. The Cincinnati National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is one of the most beautiful museums I have ever been to. It is five stories, and the front that faces the Ohio River is floor-to-ceiling glass. The Cincinnati Bengals Stadium is on one side. The Cincinnati Red Stadium is on the other side. They're facing the Ohio River, and through the windows, any place you are, you can see the bridge that connects Ohio to Kentucky, and that part of the river is where slaves actually try to cross. It is it, just standing in the museum, you have a moment. They have a fully reconstructed slave cabin inside the museum. And for the quilters, they have one of three of the largest pieces of quilted art in any museum. And it hangs from the third story down to the second story in the open center part of the museum. So the woman who created it worked on it for over 22 years. She made it in like twin and queen size sections and hooked them together to create this huge uh, piece. And then the image of the slave ship that I have on cargo, that is life size, 60 feet long, along one wall behind the entrance. I'm, when Any place you stand in the museum, you're feeling the history, you're seeing the history. It's, it's a beautiful destination within the United States if you ever get to go. So when she said this quilt exhibit made an impression on her because it was a timeline in quilts. And I said, I wonder if it was the black quilting exhibit and Still We Rise. She said, that was it. I said, then you saw one of my pieces. She said, then I like your work as well. So, <laughs> so that was a small world moment too. I mean, that. what are the odds, okay? <laughs> I usually present the G's Bend lecture with more information specific to the G's Bend quilters, and I will give you their information. But because we wanted to also tie it in where it falls in the timeline of the civil rights movement in the United States, then I will start with that civil rights movement timeline. And as I said, between apartheid and South Africa, I mean, quilts have been used as protest art and to bring attention to certain circumstances from slavery and before. Abolitionists stitched anti-slavery messages into their quilts and used the quilts as fundraisers so that they could buy supplies, medical supplies and food and things to give to the slaves on the Underground Railroad. The largest piece of quilted uh, information and protest art is the names quilt for the AIDS project. And to date, in the Guinness Book, that is still considered the single largest piece of textile art ever created in the world. And it's still growing. In the civil rights movement that we are familiar with between the 1950s and 60s, some of the most significant incidences began in the late 1940s, peaked in the 50s, and then to the 60s with the most recent civil unrest. In 1946, the Supreme Court banned segregation on intercontinental bus travel, so basically Greyhound type bus travel. A lot of people don't understand that that was what sparked the Freedom Riders. The Freedom Riders were decades later in 1961, but the reason they were riding the buses across country was because a civil rights decision from the Supreme Court said that it was illegal to deny a person of color a ticket on a Greyhound bus, and so many states were still doing it. In 1948, Harry Truman issued an executive order that ended segregation in the armed services. So even though 
there were black regiments like the Buffalo Soldiers during the Civil War, which was 100 years before this, the Supreme Court still had to pass a law saying the armed services had to be open to people of color before the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force would allow black individuals to enlist. That's what the movies, Men of Honor and things like that are about, about people in our lifetime who were still struggling to have those Supreme Court decisions upheld. They were trying to enlist because it was a law that they could, but no one before them was able to. In 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education decision was five court cases consolidated into, into one that made it to the Supreme Court before it ended segregation in public schools. And that determination basically stated that prior to that, it was considered separate but equal schooling. But separate but equal was not equal because the schools that had the predominantly students of color did not have the same facilities. They did not have the same books, supplies, or pay for the teachers. So they had larger classroom sizes and fewer graduations. So these decisions in the timeline were all leading up to today, and of course, None of those conditions exist anywhere in the United States today, right? Okay. <laughs> in 1955, um, the most memorable of these civil rights actions occurred, and that was the Montgomery bus boycott. And that was supposedly sparked by the woman they call the mother of the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks. But, uh, just as an aside, my mom is from Jamaica. My mom of 91 is here with me today. And mom came over from Jamaica to Cuba and then from Cuba to Miami. And in Miami, she rode the bus from Miami to Minnesota. She came over at the bequest of a U.S. ambassador to be a nanny for his children. And... For three days on the bus, the Greyhound bus, sitting behind the driver with a thick accent, every white person that boarded the bus was complaining, tell her to move to the back. And mom would let into them. And they couldn't understand what she was saying, even though she was speaking English. And the driver had already had an encounter and decided he gave up. And as long as nobody bothered her, they'd make the trip. This was 1951. Rosa Parks was 1955, okay? So. <laughs> now, in the Rosa Parks incident, their buses for inner city public transportation had designated, I mean, literally, a tape line on the floor of the bus. The first five rows of seats were for white passengers only, then the back part of the bus, it was four rows back at that time, the length of the bus, um, were for any people of color. Rosa Parks had had an encounter with the same driver. You know if you ride city transportation, there's one set of drivers that had that regular route, just like your mailman is a regular. So they had had encounters before where he would rough her up and try to tell her she's supposed to move back. She never sat in the white section. She always sat in the first row of the colored, colored section. That particular day, the bus was full. Four or five white passengers got on. The driver stood up. He told the four individuals, Rosa and three men, sitting in the first row of the black section to move back. And her, the quote in her biography says she was not refusing to move because she was tired. She was refusing to move because she was tired of it. And the three men got up. They didn't want to get into it with the driver because they felt a man driver would have a tendency to really physically want to fight them as men. But she refused. So they called the police. She wouldn't get off. The bus had to pull over. She wouldn't get up. She stood her ground. She was in the colored section. 
When the officers came, of course she was arrested, there was an attorney named E.D. Nixon. And for about two or three years prior to that, with all of the other civil unrest, with voting and everything else that was going on around the country, he was looking for a face to be the civil rights movement. And he came across several male individuals, but he felt that that would be too hard to sell. So when this happened with a woman who was petite and soft-spoken and she was a seamstress, and so he felt, okay, she's the face of the civil rights movement. He had gotten together with several ministers and they founded the Montgomery Improvement Association. It was called the MIA. And at that time, Dr. King was new to Alabama, but he was gaining popularity so quickly because he was such an eloquent speaker. You could listen to him for hours. And when we use the phrase, especially black people, when we say, oh, now is church, it's because the black churches dating all the way back to time of slavery, that's how black people disseminated information. So when you say, oh, now is church or preach, that means give me the news. And in what everyone else thought, okay, they're just, you know, they're praying, they, they're uh, singing, and they're just praising the Lord, they were actually having meetings afterward and sharing the information that they needed to share to survive as a race in America. So the churches were the places after actual church business to disseminate information, especially during the civil rights movement. And Dr. King was asked to be the first president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. So Nixon, the attorney, and Dr. King decided, why don't we print up flyers so that the day of Rosa's trial, it was back then you really did get speedy trial. It was five days after she was arrested. Um, they said, let's print up flyers, send them home with all of the school kids, all of the black school kids, saying that if she's found guilty, we're going to boycott the buses. They did not know the success that they would have at the time. And this was within five days of the news all over the papers and everything about what had happened. By the day of the trial, five days after she was arrested and found guilty of violating segregation laws, she was instantly fired from her job as a seamstress. But the following day, 35,000, not 100, 35,000 of the flyers had been passed out, and the Montgomery bus boycott to this date was still the single largest, most successful boycott of any public system. So whether you boycott the prison system or buses or the post office or whatever, the Montgomery bus boycott, it lasted about a year. And in 1956, a year later, the attorney's house and Dr. King's home, they were both bombed. They were both firebombed. Parks and her family eventually moved to Detroit. She died at age 92 in 2005. But uh, Rosa Parks was the first woman to lie in state in the U.S. Capitol when they, like how they did with Senator McCain, where they had them uh, on public display for everyone to be able to pay the respects who can get to that site. And she was the first woman that they did that with in 2005. In 1957, ministers and civil rights leaders began to organize more protests and marches because each incident escalated the tension and the disparities and something had to be done. The grant that I received from Laguna Beach is to create an exhibit of my protest art. And it will have protest quilts and journals because just like we all experienced when we were having lunch, people want to touch the quilts. The signs will say, thank you for not touching the quilts, but please write your comments in the journals. 
So every quilt will have a journal for you to be able to write your reaction to the piece. So if I have a piece about women's rights, you can actually write in, hey, I was at the Women's March in Chicago in 2017. You could, whatever your reaction or response is to any of the pieces, you'll be able to write them in the journal. In 57, when they began to organize these different groups, then that was also the same year as the incident of the Little Rock Nine where students were blocked from entering the Arkansas High School. And the president had to, Eisenhower at the time, had to call out National Guard troops to escort the black students into the high school because it was the law that the high school was to be integrated. But each state, each city, still had their own sheriff or their own mayor that was running things the way they wanted to, so people were still fighting for their civil rights. Now, I'm mentioning things that are getting into the 1960s. That's our lifetime. This is not ancient US history. This is while we were kids. That, that was going on in this America. But nothing like that is happening now, right? OK. In 1960, in Greensboro, North Carolina, that's the famous Woolworth lunch counter sit-in, where the students, four black students from a college, went into the North Carolina Woolworths, the store that's Walmart now. <laughs> and they sat at the lunch counter, and only white customers could sit at the lunch counter. Blacks would have to come in through the back, order their food, and then leave through the back. They weren't sitting in to eat. And it was already passed by the Supreme Court that any person entering a public eating establishment was to be served if they were paying money. So the reason these protests occurred were not because these black people were just trying to be aggravating and agitating and hard-headed. It's because these were already laws, but no one was making these cities and states abide by and enforce these laws. And if these brave individuals, each one before us, had never stepped up and knew someone was going to spit on them and throw a glass of water on them and try to trip them when they're walking out the door, then this stuff still would not have changed. The rapper Jay-Z, a lot of people don't know that's Beyonce's husband, and between the two of them, they are multi-billion dollar moguls, and no one handed them their first million. They were self-made through the music industry. Jay-Z has some lyrics in a song that said, Martin marched so Rosa could sit so Obama could run. And see, people don't understand, just because you don't know what the rap is saying doesn't mean it's saying something negative. That song is teaching the young people listening to that song something. Okay, in 1961, we're back to the Freedom Riders. That law was enacted by the Supreme Court in 1946. But 20 years later, 25 years later, black people were still not able to buy a Greyhound bus ticket in so many states. So the first Freedom Riders, a group of 13 college students, decided if someone doesn't step up and change it, it won't change. So they were determined to make their first ride from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. They were going to ride the Greyhound bus cross country north to south. To, it was just so every city they would bring national attention to the fact that, OK, this city let us ride through peacefully. This city still is not abiding by the Supreme Court decision. That's a law. That was the point of it. The point of it was not to cause riots and cause civil unrest. That was the result. But the point of it was so other black people would be able to finally ride the Greyhound bus. And these young people stepped up. And they knew they would encounter challenges. They didn't anticipate the amount of violence. And four of the original 13 were eventually killed for trying to ride the bus. And riding so 
any of us could ride the bus. That's why they did it. So the Freedom Riders challenged the non-enforced public bus law, and it was Mother's Day, 1961, when they got to Arkansas, and Klan members and Aryans were waiting for the bus, and they broke out the windows as the bus came through town, and they threw bombs inside the bus, and that's when four of them were killed. 1963, Governor George Wallace was an elected governor of the state, stood in the doorway of the University of Alabama to block the black students from coming in to register because that was going to be the first semester that black students tried to register at the University of Alabama. And now, okay, what kind of football team would they have now, okay? I, I just, I don't understand how, okay, you're, we're okay with you, you know, you can play golf with us, Tiger Woods is amazing, but I don't really want you to, you know, sit at my table. And we are all human beings. It's, it's wow, but, okay, so students um, form a resistance and after that happens, then by then President John F. Kennedy had to send the National Guard because Governor Wallace was breaking the law. So Kennedy sent the National Guard to allow those students to be able to register. In 63 is also the year that 25,000 people of all colors march on Washington, and that was for jobs and freedom. And that was when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Now I will start to weave in G's Bend. G's Bend, Alabama is just a little bit south of Selma. And it's an isolated rural community. To date, in 2019, there are probably fewer than 1,500 permanent residents in G's Bend. Gee's Bend was named after Joseph Gee's. He was the major landowner. He came from North Carolina and established a cotton plantation in 1816. He had 17 slaves. In 1845, he sold to a distant cousin named Mark Petway. And Petway had 102 slaves. Petway marched his 102 slaves across five states over several weeks to get to G's Bend to assume the property. After the emancipation had freed the slaves, many of them, they had to stay on as sharecroppers. This by now is the 1930s. They stayed on in the area that they knew they didn't have money to go anyplace else. You're a freed slave, you don't get two weeks severance or something like that and then start out someplace else. So they all, the community was so old within itself and isolated that it was like one big family. Now, when you go to G's Bend today, the three predominant surnames, because the slaves were given the names of the white masters, the three predominant surnames are Young, G's, and Petway. Oh, at least 75% of the people that you might meet from the G's Bend area have one of those surnames. And they are not all related. It's because they all got that name from two, three, four hundred years ago. Their ancestors got that surname. And so that's the name that was put on every birth certificate since then within those families. But what makes the community of G's Bend so unique, so outstanding, and so phenomenal around the world now is that you may have a community of a very well-known quilt group, or you may have a community of artists, or this may be a surfing town. The community of G's Bend, almost every single woman in the community, in some way or another, is affiliated with their quilting. So it is even larger than a Mennonite community or an Amish community. And 
in those communities, they're doing the quilting along with the other things that are part of their necessary communal way of life. In G's Bend, the women are all quilters for hundreds of years. And it's all of the women in the community participate in the quilting in some way. It was considered an African hamlet because it was still so out of time. They didn't have running water and electricity and things like that. When the G's Men quilters came to national attention, it was after a black man who was also an NEA National Heritage Fellow, a man named Roland Freeman, wrote a book called Communion of Spirits. And the book was about black antiquities and black art across the country. And he's a, he got it for photography. He's, oh, a phenomenal, incredible photographer. And he organized a quilt exhibit, and part of the book shows some of the quilts from his exhibit. When Roland Freeman put the book together in like 1996 or something, 97, a white antiquer named, ah, <laughs> a white antiquer who wrote the G's Ben books. Oh, come on, Al. <laughs> Trying to tell you too many things at one time. But it was a man and his son, Arnett. It was William and uh, Bill Arnett, um, father and junior. He has two sons. And when Arnett saw a picture in Roland Freeman's book, of a woman and her granddaughter standing in front of a wood pile with two quilts over the wood pile behind them. This was the quilt on the wood pile. Her original, not mine. When Arnett saw that photograph in Roland Freeman's book, then Arnett told his sons, we need to find the person who made this quilt. What if there are other beautiful pieces like this in that community? So no one had really heard of G's Bend outside of the people who lived around the G's Bend community in Selma, Alabama. G's Bend is at the bend of the river. And so that's why that's that isolated little pocket. And they had a ferry that would take them from G's Bend, cut across the river to Selma, so they could shop once a month or whatever. And otherwise, if they had to take the road, they would ride share, and the road would be more than a two hour trip. When Arnett saw the quilts and traveled to G's Bend, he said, I'd like to meet, he took the book. He said, I'd like to meet the lady who made this quilt. And everybody in the community is very close knit and closed off. And they're saying, well, we don't know. We'll, you know, we'll give her the message. Well, they wouldn't tell him how to get in touch with her. She was a pet way. So after two days of him asking around, then finally she agreed to see him. And he went to her house and he said, I saw your quilt in the book and I want to buy it. And she started laughing. She said, that old thing. And so he said, what do you mean? She said, I don't know if I even still have it. I might have burned it. And he said, what? She said, well, when moths get in them, we burn them to keep the moths down from out of the other ones. So she reaches under a bed and pulls out a blue tarp, and the quilts are all stacked on the tarp, and they're under the bed in the summer months when it's too hot for a quilt. They only pull out the ones they're going to use and put them on the bed in the winter. So she found the quilt. He's looking through the whole stack that she had pulled out while she's trying to find this one. He didn't know just under the bed there would be a treasure trove, and this is just one person's house. He said, I'll give you $1,000 for that quilt. She said, if you're going to give me $1,000, you can pick two more. <laughs> so, she took the check to the bank, laughing. And in the bank, she said, there's a crazy white man paying perfectly good money for old quilts. So she had a meeting at her house the next day with the, some of her other quilting friends. At least a dozen ladies came, and they each brought two or three of theirs. And the man, I mean, he had a light bulb moment. Him and his son said, this is an exhibit of fine art. And the ladies were laughing, and they, you know, they were thinking, this is just tickling us to death. 
but he knew what he was looking at. This man was a world famous antiquer and historian, and he and his sons traveled around the world collecting antiquities. He knew what he was looking at. So the first couple of G's Bend exhibits were not in quilt shows. Quilters were turning their noses up at those quilts, those crooked edges. Oh my goodness, can't they cut a straight line? But the ladies were taking apart, literally taking apart clothing. And when you take apart a pant leg or a sleeve, this is the shape. So that was the shape of that edge of the quilt when they sewed that piece down. The first places those quilts were shown were international galleries and museums because those people knew what they were looking at. And when the quilt community is turning their noses up because they're not encrusted with Swarovski crystals and they're never supposed to land on a bed for your cat to walk on, I, these ladies were making real utilitarian quilts. They were making real quilts and they were doing them completely intuitively. These were their own original designs or designs that were passed down through the women in their family and the first set of books interviewed the quilters and showed different quilts from each one. The second set of books, starting with the architecture of the quilt, interviewed the quilters and asked them their inspirations. And they would say things like, well, when my chores are done and I'm sitting on the porch and the sun hits those steps a certain way and I see that shadow and I'm thinking, that looks like a quilt design to me. I mean, they were explaining how they literally design from their head, their heart, their soul. They had never seen a quilt magazine, never been to a quilt shop, never saw a quilt show on TV. And it took places like Houston and other big uh, Paducah and whatnot, big quilt show entities, took them more than 10 years to catch up with the art community with these G's Bend quilts. And since then, since, Arnett and Roland Freeman's book, there have been three different PBS specials, over three dozen books about the quilters of G's Ben, a series of US postage stamps with the quilts of G's Ben were issued in 2002. Do you think these ladies care if we're looking at their crooked edge? <laughs> and this is a community that until they became world-renowned, literally, they did not have indoor plumbing and running water in G's Bend, Alabama. That's why they were considered such an isolated hamlet. Now back to our timeline. In 1963, when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had just seen that President Kennedy had to send National Guard, saw what Wallace was trying to do to block the university students. By then, 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama had been bombed, killing four little girls and injuring over 22 people that were in a Sunday school class. But that doesn't still go on in America today, right? I mean, how? what is it gonna take? And how long does it have to go on? And this is not fake news. History is something you can't make this stuff up. And we should be so appalled while we are so hopeful. But do we know what these people had to sacrifice for me to be your guest speaker today? The President Kennedy outlines the civil rights legislation and he is killed before he can sign it into law and he's killed for going on TV saying that he's outlining civil rights legislation. So the person who actually got credit for it was President Lyndon Johnson because he signed the 1964 Civil Rights Act when he had to assume the presidency. But he and Kennedy were on the same page with it's about time. So by 1965, first it's King, first it's, uh, King and then Kennedy and then Malcolm X is assassinated. And each of these assassinations to this day, people, they call it conspiracy theories, but people think that the government kind of knew there were like hits 
out on these individuals. There were groups that were so radical that did not want this kind of change. So they made sure nothing was in place yet to prevent it. In Selma, the march from Selma to Montgomery was to protest black voter suppression. That doesn't still go on now anymore either, okay? The local police brutality uh, was, it was phenomenal. It, it's historic. It's still shown in museums in other countries, them using the fire hoses on the protesters and whatnot. That, that imagery is in other countries. After the court battles, then King held two more marches and finally reached Montgomery two weeks after that first Selma march was attempted. He visited Gee's Bend, Alabama in 1965 to invite the, that black community to the march in Selma. When the sheriff in Gee's Bend heard that the black people were gonna try to attend that march, the sheriff discontinued the ferry service so they would not be able to get to Selma. This is 1965. The quilters of G's Bend, now this is how, just like the names quilt brought attention to the world of the mistreatment of victims of AIDS. Victims of AIDS were being turned away from hospitals. That's why the names quilt project was started. It was protest, protest art in the quilts. These individuals in G's Bend through quilting were becoming nationally and internationally known now in 2001, 2002, 2003. In 2006, the ferry was finally reinstated because the community of surrounding Alabama was so embarrassed that it was so difficult for tourists and visitors to see the area of G's Bend when they came to, this is from 1965 to 2006. But that doesn't still happen today, right? That kind of Joe Arpaio sheriff punishment. Oh, that just wouldn't just, that wouldn't go on today. Can you believe, we're not even just talking about in our lifetime, we're talking about yesterday. Can't make this stuff up. You can fact check me on your phone while I'm talking, okay? <laughs> so after the Selma march, like I said, they were turned away the first time they tried to march. That was the first week in uh, that month. Two weeks later, he held the march and they did reach um, their destination. Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act to prevent literacy tests from being given before you can vote. So their justification, and when I say they, I mean any individual who's trying to break the law that's already been established by the Supreme Court. They're trying to enact voter suppression and not have people of color vote in certain parts of the country. So in certain polling places, you could walk in, cast your vote. Other polling places where they're trying to control the vote they would give you a literacy test first, a reading test. I can imagine it was probably Shakespeare. They give you a reading test before you can cast your vote. And their justification was to make sure you could understand which box you were checking. When the vote was held in 1994 in South Africa, that was the first free and open election of the president of South Africa in that country's history when they elected Mandela. The ballot is a piece of art. The ballot is about two and a half, it's about two and a half uh, feet long, all in color, and it had every candidate's picture, and then the little flag that represented their party, and then their name, and then a, a description of the community that they are from. So that whatever you're looking at, you could check the right box. And I, it, the ballot was like a beautiful piece of art. They were selling them on infomercials after the election and people were buying the surplus ballots. There's an Im a small image of one on my quilt. Mm -hmm. 
My brother-in-law is an entertainer. He's an Emmy Award-winning actor. And he and uh, Roger Moore, the guy who played the saint and played James Bond, they were the two that were asked to do the infomercials to sell the surplus ballots after the election. My sister and my brother-in-law traveled to Ghana when the bones were unearthed at a building site in New York back in like 1999, and it was all over the news. They were about to put up a high rise, and they unearthed a set of bones. And when the bones were carbon dated, they were found to be the bones of slaves, of two slaves. So there was a big deal in this country and in West Africa about returning the bones because a museum in New York wanted to claim them and uh, West Africa in Ghana, they said, no, you're returning the bones. So there was a big ceremony and several celebrities were involved and they went over, they did a PBS special of the returning of the bones too because in Elima Castle in Ghana, it's a Portuguese slave castle that still exists for tourism now. It looks like a fort, all concrete and whatnot. Elima Castle has a concrete archway and chiseled into the archway from the 1600s, it says the doorway of no return. And that's the last place that the slaves were marched out of onto the ships. And when my sister and brother-in-law visited, because now it's a tourist destination if, for history, there is an there are several rooms in the castle where the slaves were kept, and they're no taller than four feet tall, so everybody in there had to hunch over or be sitting. And there was a concrete slide from the second story courtyard area. If you did not march out chained, then they pushed you down the concrete slide till you land on the beach. But you were getting on that slave ship. And my sister's walking through, taking the tour, crying. My brother-in-law said, I can't do it. I just can't do it. So there are parts of our history, and it's our common, it's our, uh, this is our American history. This happened in another country, but that was because of what was going on with colonial American slavery. That's how we got them. And there are things that we did not learn in school and I'm hoping that as adults, we can use this information to let our kids and our grandkids know sacrifices have been made for you not to squander, but for you to move forward with this information. With your behavior and your frame of mind and the way you interact with other people in the world. Because one of my protest quotes for the next year's exhibit has the outline of what we would think is a Native American, and it says, show me your papers. Okay? Because all of us, or all of our ancestors, would have been considered immigrants if we're not Native Americans. After the Selma March the, and the Voting Rights Act, to ban the literacy tests, then in 1968, on April 4th, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on the balcony of the Memphis, Tennessee Lorraine Motel. And all that he had accomplished, he was only 39 years old when he was killed. He did not make age 40. The man who shot him, James Earl Ray, was convicted in 1969. He was caught and captured at Heathrow Airport in London. He had already fled the country. And then President Kennedy was killed two months after Dr. King. The um, March before that April, when he was killed, the month of March, he had returned to participate in the sanitation workers' strike in Memphis. And the reason he was in Memphis on April 4th is because on April 3rd, he was giving a speech at the Mason Temple Church, and that was the famous speech where it was like he had a prophetic 
uh, epiphany. That was the speech when he said, I'm not fearing any man. I am happy. I will get to the promised land. We may not get there together, but we will get there as a people. He said, I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He was giving a speech the night before he was killed. I'm telling you, for young people now, we feel like when Michael Jackson had that interview a week before he died, and he said the name of this last set of concerts is This Is It. Because I'm in my 50s, I'm not performing like this. Because when he performs, it's all or nothing. And he said the, the concert is called This Is It. And it, it, as soon as he was killed, uh, as soon as he died, we felt the same way as King after his speech saying, it was like he was saying he knew that was the last time he was addressing any of his followers. It's kind of prophetic. Um, Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act after Dr. King was killed, and then Reagan signs the King Holiday Bill, making Dr. King's birthday a national holiday in 1983, and the singer Stevie Wonder is the one who championed that legislation. Stevie Wonder is the one who kept appealing to the government and sending petition after petition with thousands of signatures from each city until they made King Day a holiday. And groups like the Black Panthers that organized in the 60s were considered radicals because they were so adamant about protecting the black communities. But the Black Panthers were not established to be a radical organization. They were established to be bodyguards and escorts for black leaders going to speak at different events because so many of the black leaders were being killed. That's why the Black Panthers were started. And there's so much propaganda that was put out about all the bad things the Black Panthers did and why they organized. The purpose of that group was to protect black leaders in the community that were being cut down, trying to get civil rights passed. After Dr. King was killed, his casket traveled different parts of the South, especially any venue where he had spoken. And two mules from G's Bend pull, pulled his casket. OK, I'd like to share some of the G's Bend quilts with you. Some of these are, as you see, on the covers of some of the books. And as I read off the names of the different quilters, you will hear the names Petway, Young, over and over, over and over. And all of these quilts all of mine, the replicas, these are all smaller than any of the originals. Almost all of the original G's Ben quilts are queen and king size quilts. They were created to be utilitarian bed quilts to cover the whole bed and hang off the side. That's why they were made. So all of mine are to scale as far as the design and all of mine, the colors, like you can see from the cover of the book and then this quilt, I tried to replicate if it was a light blue, a dark blue, a light brown, an orange, I always pick a fabric for the color, not the fabric. But I have the artistic liberty of using different fabrics. I'll have velvet and satin and silk and linen. But any of the parts of the quilt that were actually work clothes, jeans or a shirt, I used real jeans or a shirt. So when you walk up close, and you're so careful not to touch the quilts, after we're finished and we show all of them, then you'll be able to see that they really are out of work clothes. So I'll just walk around and read the labels off of the ones that are hanging. And then if the ladies want to come up and help us with the ones we're showing. And now I'll just use my outside voice. <laughs> Quilts like these, if it, how, how many of you have been to QuiltCon? QuiltCon is the Modern Guild Quilt Show. So it's almost all modern quilts. And every other year, it's in Pasadena. And then the other years, it's in Austin. These, this is what you'll see, images like this, at QuiltCon. 
The quilts of G's Bend inspired the modern quilt movement. This is called blocks, Big Blocks and Bars, and the original was from about 1979. The modern quilt movement took off in about 2000 after Roland Freeman's book, after Arnett's first national touring museum and gallery exhibits of the quilts of G's Bend. Those quilts were seen and young quilters, 20 and 30 something, were saying, I can't get all those triangles and those points to match like Granny did, but I can do this. <laughs> and modern quilts have been equated with a combination of Amish and mid-century modern and then traditional African-American quilting. And that combination of those three things is what sparked the modern quilt movement. Okay, this one is a tribute, it's called Lazy Gal Variation, and it's by Arcola Petway. And the original quilt was from 1972, or it was from 1976, and it was her interpretation of, what does it look like? Oh, a flag for the bicentennial, <laughs> for the bicentennial. This is a part of the one that you see on one of the books. This one is Bars and Stripes, and it was on the cover of G's Band, the architecture of the quilt. And this one was by China Petway. And when I use different shades of white, it's because the original quilt had different shades of white. They used whatever pieces they had. And let me tell you, it's really, really easy to accidentally sew a curved line it's really hard to do it on purpose. <laughs> this one is called Blocks, and it's by China Petway. And the original quilt was from 1975. Every single one of these will remind you of a piece of mid-century modern art. Yeah. That's what the modern quilt movement is based on the quilts of G's been. And the first set of modern quilters going on Martha Stewart and writing books and doing lectures, they're not giving the G's Bend quilters their due. And those quilt, modern quilt movement didn't start till after the quilts of G's Bend were national. This one is, I have SC fabric on the back. This is house top eight block variation. And this one originally was designed in 1975 by Linda Petway. And again, any of these Petways and um, Arc uh, Youngs that I name are not related. That's just the common surname. And mine are small to the originals. The originals were all queen and king size. Okay, this one is called Roman Stripes. A variation of the crazy quilt. This is by Plummer Petway. And the original was from 1960. These are modern quilts. Modern quilts. Now, to quilters now, today, they would call this uh, rail fence, like a variation of rail fence. These are the replicas of the quilts of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So when Arnett the white antiquer, when he saw piles of quilts like this in that community, he knew what he was looking at. And he knew this deserved national attention. And Jane Fonda was one of the first people that did one of the PBS specials on the quilts of G's Ben. People that collect art knew what they were looking at. This one, this was a similar to that type of rail fence, three in one direction, three in the next direction. When I was putting together the exhibit for Mancuso, when I was putting together the exhibit for Mancuso, I had several that I wanted to be able to send. Mancuso contacts me. They say, when will it be ready, Allison? We're sending FedEx, and what is the dimension of the box? This was still laid out on the floor the way it's supposed to go when FedEx came. Oh, and I said, I'm not making this a UFO. So I sewed it together and cut it apart and sewed it together and cut it apart. 
because it's a, the basis of a modern quilt and I call this urban scape because it looks like alleyways and apartment windows and power lines. And this quilt is go going to be auctioned by the Mervyn Dimely Jazz and Arts Festival on April 27th to raise money for inner city youth in the South Central community through the Dimely Foundation. That's the one that Holly put in the brochure. And then another one of just my modern pieces that's inspired by the Quilts of G's Band. This one has a sleeve on the top and the bottom because it can hang either way. This hung in the Ontario Museum for their exhibit year before last that was called Traditional Goes Modern. And we had to take a traditional block and make it a modern quilt and explain what the inspiration was. So I call this one How to Get Away with Modern. <laughs> but my little brother says it's Hot Wheels tracks. Because <laughs> that's what it looks like. This quilt was um, one of 30 quilts across the country that was invited for an exhibit last year that was, a, it was called G's Ben Inspired, and it was at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, and they put out a national call across the country, but they only accepted 30 quilts. They have a book for it, but I don't have the book yet. I just got the quilt back. But I call this Mixed Greens. When, people, when I lecture or I teach a workshop for the different quilt guilds or at the quilt shows, people know that when they send fabric to me, so many other people will get a chance to enjoy whatever I'm making. So one of the, Holly asked me, where do I usually shop for the fabric? If you see me shopping for fabric, please steal my purse. <laughs> I cannot walk through my sewing room like this. People mail me boxes of fabric. It's, I mean, it's such a blessing. It's incredible. This hand-dyed fabric, the, a woman who lives in Chicago was a student of mine in one of the Mancuso workshops I taught in 2015. And then right after, she started mailing me fabric from two quilt shops that were selling out. She sent me about six different hand-dyed colorways that still had the tag stapled to it, $25 a yard. You don't even want to cut this stuff, but this is what you get when you do cut it. So this one I call mixed greens. And this is in the book that was a tribute to G's Ben. Another one of the pieces of hand dyed that she sent me, this one just got a blue ribbon in one of the shows earlier this year for innovative quilting because it features my tangle doodle quilting. Uh, this one I call Every Now and Zen, and it's another piece of the hand dyed. And all of my quilts, people ask me, do I send stuff out? That's, no, that hangs in front like I hand it to you. Just oh, grab the okay, corner. Sorry. Yes. All of my quilts, from the time I sketch them on the back of a piece of junk mail until I put the label on and put it in the box, I do not send anything out to be quilted and everything is on a tabletop machine. Hmm. Now, this one, it's another G's Ben quilt. This is Blocks and Stripes, and this is by Missouri Petway. The original quilt was from 1942 when that lady designed this quilt. And this quilt is like any of the modern quilts that you will see in a quilt show. And again, they used uh, regular cottons. They mixed in a lot of polyester fabrics, too. I use a fabric to match the color exact when I'm creating a replica. So I'm trying to match the color, I'm not trying to match the fabric. But it's fun to use satins and silks because I don't care how polished a cotton is, it's not gonna give you the sheen of a satin or a silk. And that's what makes a quilt look so completely different from the original, but it is exactly the same color and everything. And these designs are the designs these ladies work just creating on their own. They weren't even sketching stuff out. They just start sewing yeah. till it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then they stop. Okay, this one you can actually see that it's a pair of black jeans in this quilt. This is called Stripes 
And this was on the cover of the book, G's Ben Quilts and Beyond. And this is one by one of the famous G's Ben quilters, Mary Lee Bendoff. And Mary Lee Bendoff was one of the guests at the Swarthmore University exhibit where this quilt was uh, displayed. So they had some G's Ben quilters there to see the tribute to them. This quilt, you can see, was from the cover of the book. This one is called Work Clothes with a Center Medallion. <laughs> and this quilt was by Annie Young. Remember I said the common pet names are Petway, Young, and G's. So Annie Mae Young, and it was on the cover of the book. Oh, this is the one that was in Roland Freeman's book, Communion of Spirits. And this is the book, the quilt, that pretty much brought national attention to the quilts of G's Ben. This is the one that was just thrown over a pile of wood behind a picture of her and her granddaughter. <laughs> This was on the cover of another one of the books, and both of these were part of the postage stamp collection. This is Framed Bars and Stripes, and the original to this one was from 1974. And again, like I said, it's easy to accidentally sew something crooked, but it's hard when you're trying to do that on purpose. <laughs> so I don't know, though, the last one, my precious cargo. I brought precious cargo just to be able to share with you because this is one of my masterworks. I only have two that I consider my masterwork. It's this one and one that I did with nine roosters on it. Mm -hmm. It has over 35, the rooster quilt has over 3,500 needle turn applique pieces. <laughs> it took about nine years and it was a commission. It's not my quilt. But the lady has left it to me in her will. Aww. So we are lifelong friends. Every birthday, every Christmas, we only give each other chicken themed gifts. <laughs> so I'm the chicken lady when I sign her card. She's the chicken lady when she signs my card. But cargo, this is from an actual two different pages of a US history book and from high school. So this was on one page, this was on another page. And this page was an image from what they call a broadside or a pay bill, which is like a flyer from uh, 1769, advertising kidnapped Africans for sale. And they were referred to as a cargo to depersonalize the fact that it was human beings that were being sold. And while I was making this, my worry dolls are so cute when I see this posted over and over online, and the people say, I wonder where she got those little dolls. Yeah, right. <laughs> so <laughs> each of my little worries, I have them dressed in the clothing that I cut out of the center of each link. There's over a hundred and something links. Every single one is a different African fabric. And the quilt was designed to be looked at from the front and the back. So when you get to come up, you'll see the back of the quilt is a patchwork of African fabrics and the continent of Africa. And the piece on the back that's the continent, it's an embossed piece of silk and it has black people on it. And I said, that's my Africa when I saw the fabric. So it took several years to finish it, but it was as I found the right fabric that I'm working on it. So the links of chain, there's over a hundred of those. There's over a hundred fabrics in total. There's more than a hundred of my Why Worry dolls. The Worry dolls originated in Guatemala and it was embroidery floss or thread wrapped around matchsticks. And you're supposed to put the little doll under your pillow and tell it your troubles and you're dreaming of a solution. So they were called Worry dolls. I call mine Why Worries and they are I wrapped around wire so that they can be posed and I use jewelry links to create the chains and some of my worries are even pregnant so when you walk up you can see that one of my nieces she's 18 now but while I'm still working on this she was about seven and she said Al they took pregnant ladies I said two for the price of one baby if you couldn't run fast enough and so while I'm creating this work I am even within my own family trying to explain to them why I'm making this. And that particular niece, I received two grants from the state of California with her for quilting, and two grants from the state of California with her older sister, 
for quilting. And whatever projects we worked on with the grant, we would take them to their schools. They would have a Black History Month assembly. They would be able to show their work. And they were telling the stories in the quilts that we created through the grants when they were sharing that with their friends at school. And her older sister, when we got the first grant from California in 2001, her older sister was eight at the time, and she was the youngest apprentice artist that the state of California had ever funded. So it, uh, we've been trying to pass it on. At this, at this point, yes, I would like to thank you. The cowrie shells are shells from Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah, the and there's some glass beads on here and some bone beads, but the cowrie shells are from Africa. And I was uh, mentioning a funny story. I had an exhibit in the African American Performing Arts Center in Albuquerque in 2016. It was the largest solo artist quilt exhibit for the entire year. I had 64 pieces. Mm -hmm. in, oh, I have over 200 quilts. That's why they keep trying to, they can't believe I'm going to let Dimely auction one because I just won't get rid of them. But I, every trunk show, I can take two dozen quilts, and even if you've seen my trunk show before, um, you're seeing new quilts if it's a different lecture. So the lady who saw the Underground Railroad lecture, these are different quilts from what she saw. And while I was at the African American Performing Arts Center, when we had the reception, <laughs> I only had two quilts roped off, and one was this one, just, you know, with the little rope. Yeah, it's kind of emphasizing the sign is right here that says thanks for not touching the quilts. And I had the sister quilt to this that's called Jump the Broom. And it shows a plantation wedding scene with some more of my little worry dolls. And a lady was reaching across the rope anyway. And I was biting my lip and my sister said, please don't touch it. And she snatched her hand back. She said, I'm sorry, I didn't have my glasses on. And I had to take a breath because I was about to say, so were you going to frisk it like it's in Braille? But I was supposed to be the gracious home. So my sister said, Al, I can't believe you still have five slaves. <laughs> and so that was funny to me because it was like she was saying, I still have five slaves. But she meant she can't believe anything is still attached <laughs> to the court. But this quilt has traveled across the country in the past 10 or 12 years over and over and over. So I know people have touched it. I know they have. But I have them on there pretty good. So if you get a chance after and you walk up, you remember to look at the back as well. Are there any questions? Oh, wow. Yes. Did you have to access permission from the original quilters of G's Bend before you replicated the quilts? No, I did not for two reasons. Because I'm not trying to sell them and because I'm giving the name of each quilter as I present each quilt. Yes. The shackled hands, uh, is that your inspiration or did you pull that from something else? Again, this is supposed to represent the slaves in the hull of a slave ship. Mm -hmm. So they would have been shackled hand, foot, and neck. Coffles yeah. on the neck and hand and foot. So I only have on some wrists and some ankles, but it would have been all three places. The one in the upper left corner? Oh, this, yeah, this, so this. Basic. Yeah, that was just because I was uh, stitching in the number 11 million. It's stitched mm. in under here, and so I wanted you to kind of look so you would be able to see that. And then the stitching, the quilting, is supposed to mimic mud cloth from Africa. The, the straight lines and the diamonds and whatnot, that's mud cloth. Yes. Do you know what is going on in G's Bend today with the younger generation? Are they carrying on? Any of them that are still residents of G's Bend, yes, they are continuing in the tradition of quilting if they remain in the community because they see that it's an important part of the area's tourist industry now, too. But if they're moving out of G's Bend, they move out and they're living their own lives or doing whatever they're interested in or whatever they go to school for. But if they remain in the community, they are trying to really be a part of that. And the William Arnett started a foundation called the Tinwood Alliance, where they have a regular sewing area space, you know, in a building at, for tourists to come in and watch while they're creating their work. And there's a gift shop with things for sale and stuff like that. Yes. I'm sorry, yes. Well, uh, the filmmaker, the son, uh, got a grant for one of the women, the younger women in her 50s, 
to study printmaking. Do you okay. know what she's doing with that? Yes, that's when they uh, replicate some of the quilt designs onto postcards and t-shirts and tote bags and things like that. Yeah. So that's why they had the equipment and everything to actually print the designs. And a couple of times they actually, you know, do an original, like you would carve in the linoleum or something to make a print. They do just real quick an original geometric that's their own design and then they use that in the printing. But they're printing those things on other items that can be sold besides just quilts. They're printing them on like prints to be framed or for tote bags and uh, postcards and t-shirts and stuff like that. I think we only have time for one. We're actually gonna have to give up the room. So we only have time for one more, I think. Okay. Okay, I, I have two questions. One is you alluded to the fact that you made dolls and quilts. Are those the dolls that you're talking I about? I make dolls of every size. Every you make size. dolls of every size. Mm -hmm. Okay, you don't have any of your other dolls here. All right, the second question is are in regards to the book that was out in front, and it's called The Quilts of Geese Bend by Rubin, and I wondered if it is out of print or unavailable or? That's my book, and I can't tell you. You don't know, okay. Okay. Thank you. Almost well, so all of them you can find online, I think, even used copies. Well, this is amazing.